It's going to be found in Hosea chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And um, this is something that I read in my own devotional time that I just felt like the moment I read it, it was something I knew I wanted to develop into a teaching because I think this, literally these verses, it's a perfect picture of what's happening in society today. And if you're taking notes, and I hope you are, the title of my talk today is What You Don't Know Could Kill You. What You Don't Know Could Kill You. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about reading the Bible and the importance of that. But if you got your Bibles, Hosea 4, 1 through 6. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. If you're watching us online, it'll be on the screen as well and behind me. And it says this, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. He has something against the people of Israel. This is what he says. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land can underline that no no there's we, we have no knowledge of God there's no reading of the Bible there's no there's no living out biblical truths and because of that they're swearing lying murder stealing and committing adultery they break all bounds and listen bloodshed always follows bloodshed bad things always follow bad things and then just get worse and worse and it starts a cycle of destruction Therefore, verse three, the land mourns and all who dwell in it languish and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend and let no one accuse for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day and the prophet also shall stumble with you by night and I will destroy your mother. Verse six is really what I wanna harp on today and you can underline this verse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people, they're destroyed not because they don't have passion, not because they don't have fervor. They, they, they're led to destruction because there's no knowledge of God anywhere. Like nobody knows what God wants or has for their lives. And because they reject the knowledge, the people of Israel reject the knowledge, God rejects them from being a priest to them. And so you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. It's heavy, heavy stuff, but there's a price to pay in our lives when we choose in our own will to ignore the word of God and believe that our lives and we know more than God is a better route than actually living from what God has for us in his word. So I want to break this down, how we can get practical, how we can learn, how to always make sure that whatever we see on the news, whatever, whatever article we read, whatever our friend tells us, we can always go back to the word of God and make sure that is biblical or not biblical so I can guide my path in the right direction. Amen. So let's pray and ask God to bless our time together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Thank you for this church. Thank you for everybody here gathered. Um, Lord, I, I just pray that our hearts will be open to receive, um, that we will learn that God, it's not, just, it's not just coming to church on a Sunday. It's not just saying we want to change our lives, but there's practice that's needed. We need to do things, habits, practices in order to see real life change happen. I pray that as a series, the power of practice goes on. We can understand that with our lives with prayer and worship and Bible reading, we will see change and we will see ourselves becoming more like you every single day. And I just pray for anybody here for the first time, Lord Jesus, they don't know you. They don't have a relationship with you, Jesus. I just pray that they would, they would make the decision to put their life in your hands and see it's the best decision they can ever make. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. And everybody said, amen. amen and amen. Thank you so much, Erica. By the way, Erica leads our worship team at youth. She's awesome. She's great. She is awesome. One of the most valuable things I learned about when I was playing football was the ability to be mentally prepared for opponents, for the game ahead. You know, fun fact, uh, football isn't just, you know, putting on some helmets and shoulder pads and tackling people like a maniac with no thinking, with no cause behind your action. No, there's actually a lot of mental preparedness that goes into the game of football more than actually the physical aspect of it. Throughout our week, our games when we were in playing college was on Saturday. So throughout the week, we would literally be practicing, watching film, studying. We'd have, our, our coaches would have reports of all of our opponents', our opponents tendencies, what they like to do. Do they run the ball? Do they throw the ball? What, what things do they like? What formations? All that stuff we would have to know. Because if we did not know any of that stuff about our opponent, the likelihood of us winning is going to be very, very low very low. We needed that knowledge in order to have confidence in beating our opponent. Uh, my position coach, 
uh, I played safety, and he would always have this phrase. He would literally tell us this all the time. The phrase literally engraved, literally, I been, haven't played football in like seven years, and I still remember it to this day. He would tell us this every single practice. Don't go until you know. Don't go until you know. And what's the meaning? What he meant was when the play is about to begin, the ball hasn't snapped yet, the play's about to begin, there is a process you need to go through in your mind before the ball is snapped, before you just run aimlessly, not doing anything that's going to help your team. So he would tell us, hey, make sure you're lined up in the right position. Okay, I'm lined up. I'm supposed to be where I'm, I'm, and this is my position. Do I know my alignment? Do I know my assignment? Like, what is my job on this play? If the team runs the ball, do, what do I do? If the team passes the ball, what do I do? There's things in my mind I have to know in order for what? In order for myself to play freely without hesitation. When the ball is snapped, I don't have to think anymore because I have knowledge of my position. So it allows me to play with more confidence. Don't go until you know. I really believe that this same principle can be applied to our lives as Christians today. Same exact principle. What I mean is the more knowledge of God that we have, the more confidence we can have in our lives to live out the exact plan God has for you and for me. Because the more we know what God has for me, what he wants from me, what he expects from my life, I can have confidence to what? I can have confidence to make sure my family is going to be raised with biblical morals. Because I know what the Bible says about how to raise my son and my daughter and my family. Now I have confidence saying I can be confident in my position as a mother and a father because I know what the Bible says. I can have confidence that I won't hesitate to stand when everything in society is spewing lie after lie after lie. Because I know my Bible and have a knowledge of God, I can defeat lies with truth because I know my study. When we have confidence in the knowledge of God, we're going to fall more in love with God every single day because we get to know him. It's not just coming to church and praying and all that stuff is great, but it's the intimacy with reading God's word that really makes us fall in love with him more and more and more. Knowledge turns into confidence. And so the question I want us to ask today and want to ask you is, how confident are you in the knowledge of God? How confident? Are you in the knowledge of God? Are you, you feel like you're well-versed in scripture? You feel like you know the basics? Maybe you're saying, well, Phil, life is a little bit hectic, a little bit crazy, so I feel like I'm not where I want to be. That's okay. None of us, whether we've been walking with Jesus for many years or we just started, we're not where we want to be. And that's part of the journey because we're never going to arrive. And so we have to always be building our knowledge with God. And literally, you're going to hear me say that phrase a lot. And that phrase, what it refers to is the truth about God, who God is, what he stands for, what he wants to do in your specific life. He created you for a specific plan, the best plan for your life, that if you walk in it, you're gonna have peace. You're gonna have, even when storms come in your life, you're gonna have that passion for Jesus no matter what. Who is God and what he wants to do with my life? And in the Bible, in the Hebrew language, knowledge is yada, yada. And what it means is it's not knowledge, just brain knowledge that like you would study for a test or FCAT or something like that. Praise God, I don't have to do the FCAT anymore. It's the worst thing ever. It's from the devil himself. It's not brain knowledge. What yada means, it describes more a personal and relational knowledge. It's, it's the difference between just knowing about somebody versus actually knowing that somebody. So like I, I'm close with my wife. I know who she is. I know what makes her laugh. I know what doesn't make her laugh. I know what gets her mad. I know what doesn't get her mad. Like I know these things. It's not a far off relationship where I can guess who they are, guess what they're into and guess what they like. No, it's I know because I'm close. Because I have close proximity with this person. And the truth is God wants all of us in here today, the good news, he wants all of us in here today to experience a relationship with him, experience his love for you that he has, that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you, like free of charge. He did all the hard work so you can have the free gift of salvation. God wants you to know him and that that knowledge of God and his plan for you and his salvation plan for your life would turn into love for him that your learning of God would turn in your love for God. I love this quote by A.W. Tozer. It says this, we're going to put it on the screen. The Christian is strong or weak depending upon how closely he has cultivated the knowledge of God. It could be strong or weak. It's, it's how you cultivate. The, another word for cultivate is prepare or to work at. The, the, the passion or the lack of us working if, with the knowledge of God will determine if we have a strong life or we have a weak life. It's how we cultivate. Am I reading my word? Do I, do I have a passion to know God more? Because if I do, I'm going to be strong even when life gets hard. 
even when life gets hard. So the best way to cultivate the knowledge of God is this, is studying the word of God. Read your Bible. Reading your Bible. Reading our Bible cannot just be a Sunday school lesson we learn when we're little kids and we forget about when we're adults. This is something that literally can be life or death. Do we make more bad decisions than good ones? Do we honor God more? Or do we not honor God more? Do we know what God has to say when politics start to get really, really loud? And do we stand by his word? Or do we believe a lie and start to think that our feelings matter and my truth is more important than God's truth? This stuff matters. And if we don't know, what we're going to do is live a life based on what someone tells me or what I see. And take that in that little seed, whether it's truth or lie, will sprout and determine everything that I do with my life. Everything that I do with my life. And the goal is when we read our Bibles with our eyes, we hear the voice of God with our ears. Think about it. What is the Bible? Essentially, God chose a select few people inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down his words, to write them down. So when you're reading those written down words, in reality, what you're, what you're, what you're hearing is God's voice. It's not just a textbook, it's a life book that speaks to you, that, that wants to help you, that wants to give you boundaries in life so you don't destroy your passion or your life and make sure that you do things that are going to benefit your family and your personal life. It's more than just a textbook that we read. I love this verse, Revelation 1-3 says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear. Be blessed when you read the word of God and when you hear his voice, you're blessed. You are blessed in your life. Now that being said, I believe it will be very difficult to know who God is if you don't read the Bible. Near impossible, I would say. I would put it like this, no word of God, no walk with God. No word of God, no walk with God. Meaning if I don't, if I don't read the Bible, if I don't have a word of God knowledge, then how do I know if God is speaking to me or not? Am I close to him? Is there proximity in my life with God? Am I, the more that I read my Bible and understand, wow, I didn't know that the Bible had to say, say this about this subject. I didn't know that God loved me this much. Wow, I didn't know that God wants to give me spiritual gifts. Wow, I didn't know God. And the more we see these things, the more our passion and our love for God grows. But if we have no walk with God or we have no word with God, there can't be any walk with God. We'll be far off. We can't defend our faith. We can't, we can't know the path that God has for every single one of us, whether it's a career, whether it's a decision you have to make. You won't know clearly if you don't have a consistent word of God reading in your life. Listen, if you don't have a knowledge of God, you won't understand the importance of prayer. And so you won't make sure prayer is, a, is, is an active part of your life. Because you don't really understand how God cares about prayer. It's not going to be important to you because you don't know how important it is to God. So you don't pray that much. If you don't have a knowledge of God, then when you come in on a Sunday and worship, it's based on what song you like or don't like. Instead of, man, I don't, I don't need Kenny or the band. I don't need anybody to prompt me into worship because I know what God did for me. I lift up my hands and I sing out without any pressure or anybody having to force me. It's the knowledge of God that allows me to do things with passion, not being forced or begged or somebody grabbing my hand. You got to read your Bible today. You got to worship today. No, it's the knowledge of who God is and what he did for me that changes everything. And so I don't need anybody to tell me. I'm a grown man. I, can, I, I know when I need to do things. Yes, we come here on a Sunday and you're going to hear a word from a pastor and you're gonna, we're going to worship together. But there has to be a point where all of us are walking with God by reading the word of God. And what worries me, honestly, is the less we know about God, the more we are in danger from straying from truth. Or just believing whatever somebody tells us or what we hear. The, I think the biggest danger the church faces today is how to decipher between a truth and a lie. Like, how do we decipher that? What does that look like? Like, come on, fake news versus real news. That is the talk of every single thing that we, we see on TV. CNN or Fox News will tell you what is real or fake. You don't know. Nobody knows. I don't know. All I know is that's the battle we have to face is what is real, what is truth, what really matters, or is it a lie, I'm confused, what is going on, I don't know what to believe. Have you ever found yourself thinking that? It's like, I don't know what to believe anymore. I read one thing and then I see another thing, I hear one thing and then I read another thing, and it's this, it's this balance of tension with truth and lies, and that's why it's important to read your Bible, because your life and your thought life depends on it. There is so many ideas out in the world on your sexuality, on what to do with your money, on so many topics of life. 
And if that idea, whether good or bad, gets in your mind, it's going to direct your path. It's going to determine what you believe, how you behave, and who you become. That idea turns into a seed and literally directs your entire life. And so what happens is when we believe God's truth, we show up to reality well. When I believe God's truth, what happens is now I show up in a way that is congruent to with God's plan and good intention for his creation. When I believe what God has for my life, when I walk in his truth, I walk in the specific purpose. Doesn't mean that things are going to be perfect. Doesn't mean that everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows all day. And that, you know, one day you become a Christian and you start doing the lottery and you win $100 million. No, that's not what's going to happen. But you can have peace knowing that you're going the right direction with your life because you believe God's truth. But when you believe in lies that are not congruent with the realities of our creator's design, when you go opposite of God's design for your life, you allow these lies into your body or your whole person. And that leads to death. Truth will always lead to life, will always lead to life. Lies will always lead to death. It's the difference between going to the doctor for help or going to men's health for help. It's literally the difference. That's what we do. It's what we have to choose. So when I go to the doctor, I know that the doctor went through many years of schooling to be able to have confidence to tell me the truth when I walk to the doctor's office. If I'm sick, if I need surgery, if I need something going on, I have confidence and I could put my hope in the doctor's hand knowing that this person is the most qualified person to help me get better because of the knowledge and the work and the experience that they went through. But maybe I want to go third party route. And maybe somebody handed me a men's health or a cosmopolitan or how to lose weight, how to lose 50 pounds in one day. Like how to, and I, I go that route and I start reading the article and I start looking at these people's opinions and yeah, they throw in some data and some charts and I'm not saying it might not be truth, but it also could be lying. You won't even know it. Because here's the thing when it comes to scientific articles, just using this example specifically, there's something called peer-reviewed articles. Now, majority of major articles that deal with health are not peer-reviewed. What does that mean? It means that they weren't held accountable by people smarter than them. It means that what they're sharing with you wasn't tested. It wasn't seen by people with PhDs. It didn't take years of trial and error for it to be to the point where it says, hey, we tested this out. We filtered this through truth. And guess what? What you're reading actually works instead of, here's my opinion, take it or leave it. We, we, and this happens with everything in life. The point I'm trying to make is a lot of us, if we don't filter th things through the word of God, we could be believing lies and living if that lie is true. So someone tells me something and it sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty enticing. It, it makes you think a little bit. And because you don't realize it's a lie that they told you because you didn't go back to the word of God, you now go every single day believing that that thing is the truth when it's actually a lie. What happens? I think Bible reading becomes religious. Right? It becomes something I have to do. If I don't do it, then God doesn't love me. But the reality is, when Jesus died on the cross, we don't work for love anymore. We do it out of love. I, I read because I love Jesus. I read because of what he did for me. So there's no work base for love, right? That's the beautiful thing of the gospel. I don't, I don't work for love. God doesn't love me or not love me based on what I do or don't do. He gives me grace when I mess up. He gives me grace when I fail. He gives me grace when I have a bad day. That's, that's, that's the gospel. And so now because I know that I want to read the word of God, but here's the thing, the greatest enemy for us filtering things through the word of God, for us practicing the spiritual discipline of scripture reading is this, it's spiritual apathy, spiritual apathy. It's not being enthused about going to church anymore, not being enthused about reading our Bibles. It's not being concerned. It's not really thinking that if I don't read my Bible, there's not going to be that big of an issue. It's not that big of a deal. I don't need to read it all the time. I learn on Sundays. I don't have to read every single day. Phil, that's a little bit, that's a little bit difficult. That's a little bit hard. Like, and becomes religious. And we get to the point that we've known Jesus for so long or we've not practiced these spiritual disciplines for so long, we don't have the same passion that we once had. Listen, have you ever noticed that the longer you become a Christian, the harder it gets to be passionate about Jesus? Or the moment you start serving at church, you start losing passion for Jesus? Why is that? I believe it's because there's a lack of hunger for truth. That a lot of things that we do is based on feelings and those feelings fuel everything that we do. If I do something that makes me feel good, guess what? That's gonna be the fuel because I wanna experience that again. But feelings come and go. Truth does not. Truth stays the same every single day. Once something's the truth, it can't be untruth. It's truth. It's what it is. It's, it's what, it's, what it stands on. 
And so what if we, instead of living life based on feelings and letting our apathy get all over the place, we stood on truth that even on a bad day, God is still good. Even when I don't know when my next paycheck is coming, God is still good. Even when I'm going through a mental health issue, God is still good. Because that is truth, because he's good no matter what's happening in your life. And that can determine the amount of passion you have in your life. It's not feelings. I don't do things because I feel good. There's no, there's, I, I want truth. The reason I stand up on this pulpit is because I believe in the truth of God. It's worth dying for. It's worth making sure that people, I don't care if I lose friends. I don't care if I lose family members. I stand on the truth of God and that's it. Because I believe it's truth and that is all. And so the one way we can fight spiritual apathy is I think we need to have a fear of God back in the church. Fear of the Lord. And if you don't, you're not familiar with that phrase, fear of the Lord is like a respect. It's a reverence towards God. It's that when I became a Christian, I committed to this. I'm not playing games with my calling. I'm not playing games with my life. I'm not playing games in my marriage. I'm not playing games with my family. I want God to be in all aspects of my life. And so I'm going to serve him with the fear of God of like, God, I, I honor you. I worship you. I have a reverence for you. You're not just my BFF that I see on Twitter and hang out with. No, you are God. You are God almighty. And there's, there's respect. I respect. I respect who God is. And I believe the more fear of God we have, it'll start to grow, grow a desire in us to know God more. Look what it says in Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When we have the respect for God, we start to go on that path of hearing wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that can be shaken. You have received, if you are a Christian, you have received a kingdom that what? Cannot be shaken. Nothing can shake it. So let's offer up to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. You see, Israel stopped doing this. Israel got comfortable. Israel, in the book of Hosea, they stopped hungering for God, so they stopped growing spiritually. And what they did was, is they rejected and they ignored the word of God, the Bible, and they put their hope in third party countries. Assyria, Egypt at the time, they felt like they can partner with Egypt to be more prosperous. They, they thought they could partner with Assyria to, to have peace treaties, but in reality, they ignored who God was. They omitted God's word and it led them down to disaster. Here's the truth, and what we can learn from verses one of two, uh, verse one and two of Hosea, is the sins of omission will always lead to the sins of commission. What does that mean? It means that when we omit God's word in our life, when we omit to learn his ways, when we omit to spend time with him, it opens the door to sin. It commissions us, it gives us authority that we don't have to say, oh, I'm going to ignore this so I can do this and be commissioned to do something that God doesn't want me to do. And it doesn't help, listen church, it doesn't help that our society wants us not to live by the Bible. It wants all of us, society, wants us to live by our own truth. Have you ever thought about the slogans we see in society in modern day America? Literally, I have a couple here. Uh, Nissan will tell you, life is a journey, enjoy the ride. Outback, Outback sounds actually kind of fire right now. <laughs> no rules, just right. Don Q Rum, not that I drink it, I just Googled this. <laughs> Nothing is taboo, break all the rules. Ralph Lauren will tell you, living without boundaries. Neiman Marcus will tell you, relax, no rules here. Prudential insurance, be your own rock. What is society trying to tell you? It's trying to tell you that you make your own rules. You answer to no one. You are the only one that matters. Your universe revolves around you. You should only restrain yourself if you want to. And what happens is, what does Hosea say? Bloodshed follows bloodshed. The moment we think we're our own gods, the moment we think we know more than God, the moment we think that our life is better without the Bible is the moment we lead our life to destruction. And it may not feel like destruction. It may not feel like it. You're like, well, Phil, actually I have a great house, I have a great job, awesome, but you're still a sinner. And that sin will lead us to death. All of us are sinners. All of us are on that road, but we have Jesus Christ that saved us on that cross. And now we can know that life is not going to lead to death. It's going to bring more life and more life and more life. And that's what I want for my life and my family and my marriage and my friends and the people that I work with. I don't want to make my own rules. I don't want to think like I have it all together because I don't. I don't at all. I love that whenever I feel like I'm starting to be the God of my home and I think I know some more, my wife humbles me. Hey, that was a great message you preached on Sunday. 
take out the trash, big guy. You know, it's like, okay, cool, awesome. Thank you, I needed that. Like, so make sure we never think that we know more than God because we'll end up like Israel and Israel now is being cursed by God, is being rejected by God because of their misunderstanding. Don't believe the lie that your life is better without the Bible. I love this verse and maybe some of us heard it. It's Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. It says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own, your understanding and all your ways acknowledge him. And when you do that, he will make your path straight. I feel like there's people in here today, your life is all over the place and you've been trying. It's not because you're not It's not because you're not intentional about changing your life. You want to change your life. And you've been trying to do things your own way. But can I tell you, the moment you give your life to Jesus, he will make your path straight. Again, like I said, it's not going to be easy. It's going to have, there are going to be some good days. There are going to be some bad days. But you can have confidence knowing that he's going to guide you every step of the way. And you're not going to be confused. You're not going to be left alone. You're not going to be abandoned. He will be with you and your paths will be straight. And you can have peace. You can have peace for your life that you can't find anywhere else. And so why is the power of practice so important? Is because of this. In order to decrease our separation from God, to get to the point where we want to be our own boss and we get so lost into that ideology that we stop coming to church, we don't read our Bibles, we don't even believe in Jesus anymore, and nobody can find us. We separated from God. In order to decrease our separation from God, we need to be disciplined to increase our knowledge of God. We got to be disciplined. We have to be disciplined. Look what 1 Peter 3.15 says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared. You gotta be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason you hope, you have the hope that is in you. Do it with gentleness and respect. What it's saying is, if somebody asks you a question about the Bible, are you prepared to answer that question? With gentleness, if one of your kids asks you something they learn in school, Will you be ready to counsel them and give them biblical wisdom to help them with gentleness and respect live out as a Christian in their high schools or in their middle schools? Are we prepared? This is not a job just for me, guys, for the pastor and our dream team. No, this is this is all of us are called to this. All of us are called to this. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word, the Bible, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let it light your path in life. So let's get to the practical stuff. Four practical things you need to know. If you want to start creating a habit, start the power of practice to increase your knowledge of God. And here's what I want you to understand. Whether you work two jobs, whether you're a single mom, whether you're a college student and you're up to your ears in homework and studies and papers, don't lose hope. You can have a consistent Bible reading plan in your life. It's doable. It's not impossible. It doesn't have to be this near impossible thing that's never attainable. It can happen in your life. And I want to give you four things that can help you. And the first one is this. First thing we need to know is Sundays are not enough. Sundays aren't enough. Sundays are not enough, guys. Here's the thing. You're going to hear this message. Maybe around Monday, you're going to forget it. Is this the truth? You can go back on our YouTube and watch it. That's probably not going to happen. So what happens? What do we learn when God speaks? Do we write this down? Do we have some sort of remembrance? Or it's saying, hey, Sunday is just an accelerant what's already happening in my daily life. Because here's the truth of what, what's, this is what we do on Sundays. Are you ready? 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen 18 says this. 1 Corinthians, when you come together as a church, next verse, please. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, yeah. The whole church comes together. You notice that the whole church comes together. What do we do when we come together on a Sunday? We sing to one another, we pray together, we preach the word, and we practice the ordinances, which is baptism and communion. That's all Sunday's about. That's it. Sunday is for worshiping together, which we did, praying for each other, which we did, preaching the word of God, which we're doing, and then sometimes you're gonna see baptisms and sometimes we're gonna do communion together. That's it. Jesus didn't die for the church for that to be your substitute to read your Bible. It's not, it's not what happened. It's not what, we, it's not what we do. This is not the only time for you to read. And again, this is something I had to learn at a young age. Sunday's not enough. If I'm gonna have the knowledge of God, if I'm gonna defeat lies, and if I'm gonna raise my family, if I'm gonna be the best spiritual person I can be, I gotta make sure that I'm reading the Bible on my own and not relying on Sundays to be that source. Second thing, start with Bible plans and with Bible studies. Start with Bible plans and with Bible studies. Listen, we all got to start somewhere. We all have to start somewhere. And maybe for you in the season of your life, it's reading a Bible plan that is literally just a verse and like a paragraph of explanation. 
Okay, start there. Be consistent, but don't stay there. Don't stay there. Let it grow into a Bible study. Literally what I do every day, well not every day, I try to. Right now I'm struggling on Saturdays and Tuesdays, if I'm being honest. Here's what I do. I get up in the morning, I get a cup of coffee, I have a playlist of worship playing. Uh, it's an instrumental one because the voices, I have ADD, they annoy me. And so it's like, I just want peace and quiet. I don't need you singing at me right now. I have a, a, a Bible book that I'm reading. Right now I'm reading Hosea and I read a chapter every time I open up that Bible and I do a soap plan, scripture, observation, application, prayer. I write the scripture down, I observe what I learned and I apply it to my day. And then I go outside and I pray for 10 minutes on a timer. And, and that's, my, that's my, now here's the thing, that's the season of my life. I have my wife here, she's not working at the moment and so she's with the baby and it allows me to have that free time to have, but that's gonna change and I gotta, I gotta figure out what's gonna be my, all of us have different seasons, circumstances in our life, but it's not an excuse to at least get five minutes of time, at least five minutes of your own Bible reading. Maybe it's a verse, maybe it's a chapter, I, I promise you. You could be intentional, put it on your calendar, write it as a goal. I wanna read the Bible three times this week. Start somewhere, but don't end there. And here's the thing, if you're gonna start a spiritual habit, you gotta starve another habit. You gotta starve another one. So maybe, maybe, maybe Monday, instead of going to sleep and watching Netflix before you go to sleep at night, read your Bible at that time, substitute it. I'm gonna stop doing Netflix and start reading over here. When you wake up, instead of going first thing to the news, which I don't know why you'd want to, it's not gonna be positive, read your Bible. It's like I got 10 minutes before I gotta go to work, let me get in a quick little verse. Let me do something. Let me start somewhere. Create habits by starving out another habit that's not helping you. Third thing is search for people smarter than you. We have pastors here, we have amazing connect group leaders that love the word of God. There's incredible men and women in our church that are smarter than the people that preach up here that you need to get connected with. And maybe they're your connect group leaders, maybe they're your team leads, talk to somebody. Now, a warning for those of you who listen to other preachers during the week. And that's not, I'm not saying I'm against that. I, I love listening to Tony Evans. That's my, that's my hero. I love Tony Evans. He's a man of God. I listen to him all the time. But sometimes the people we listen to aren't always telling the truth as well. In verse six, Hosea is literally telling the priest at that time, hey, God's rejecting you because you rejected God's word. And so my warning is just be careful who you follow. Just be careful who you listen to and make sure what they're saying aligns with what you're reading and then you'll be okay. Does that make sense? And then for, fourth and final is this, seek out the Holy Spirit. Seek out the Holy Spirit. If we could put the verse up, this is John 16, says this. This is Jesus speaking. He's about to go up to heaven. He says this, still I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, what's he gonna do? He's going to guide you into all truth. We have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of every single one of us as believers, but the reason we don't experience truth more often is because we're silencing that voice. We, 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 we doubt the supernatural. Oh, the Holy Spirit, there's a spirit living inside of me. That sounds a little bit weird, Phil. I don't know if I wanna awaken this spirit, but we believe in astrology. But some of us talk to rocks. So, so, so here, here, and I'm not trying to rank on you. I'm not trying to rank. I'm just saying like, all of us believe in the supernatural, whether we believe it or not. Like we all, some of us all in this place are like, man, maybe I don't believe in that supernatural, but you believe in something supernatural. And I just wonder if we can say, hey, you know what, Phil? I've tried doing things my own way. I've tried looking at the stars and seeing that I'm a Virgo and seeing this and that, and nothing has aligned to the life that I wanna live. Maybe it's because you've been silencing the one voice that can lead you into truth. The one voice that can say, hey, if you want peace for your life, if you wanna grow in your life, if you wanna have a healthy marriage, if you wanna have a healthy family, it starts by being guided by the Holy Spirit. That's where truth begins. And so it's okay to believe in the supernatural. It's okay to believe that God sent you a helper to help you in life. There's nothing weird about it. It's like, man, the last thing I need is to want to do things by myself. I embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit, to be the better husband that I need to be. Help me, Holy Spirit, to be the best dad so my good daughter can look at me and see my mom and see her mom and my dad as an example of what it looks like to live out that truth. So seek out the Holy Spirit, because here's the thing, if you read that Bible without the Holy Spirit, it's gonna just be a textbook. It's not gonna do anything for you. It's gonna frustrate you, it's gonna upset you, 
and it's gonna be a, a burden to your life and that's not what it's meant to do. The word of God is what we need more than ever, my friends. Things are gonna get crazier. Things are gonna get wilder. Politics are gonna get even crazier and crazier and crazier. Know what the Bible says because what you don't know could kill you, can literally kill you. Why don't we stand up to our feet as we wrap up service? I just wanna pray for a couple people before we end up the service. And again, in this setting like this, I don't, I don't know what everybody's life story is. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what your struggles are. I don't know what your insecurities are. I don't know what you are going through on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know what your job looks like. I don't know what you're dealing with, but I know that God knows. God knows what you're going through. God sees you. Listen to me, my friend. God sees you and he loves you so, so much. And God doesn't put things in our life to be burdens. God doesn't want a hindrance to fun in your life. No, he wants to add life to your life. Being a Christian shouldn't be boring. Knowing that you're not going to hell should not give you a sour face. Should add celebration to your life. Knowing that God loves me, he's for me. He's not gonna leave me or forsake me. What I wanna do in this moment before we pray for salvation, I wanna pray for us as a church. That maybe we've, we've put off reading our Bibles. We've made it less than, it's not on our agenda, it's not on our to-do list. Can I tell you, you gotta fight for it to be on your to-do list. Moms, dads, it's got to be on your to-do list. Some way, somehow, you got to figure it out. Dads, you got to figure it out. We need, we need more men reading their Bibles in their homes. We need more godly fathers leading by example in their homes. Too many young men and young women don't have fatherly figures in their households. It's time for us to step up. Not just the pastors, all of us. Let's read, start somewhere. And so what I want to pray for you is just an, an outpouring to be baptized in the Holy Spirit one more time just so you can have that supernatural power that the next time you read your Bible, you're not gonna get frustrated, but you're gonna see the life in it. You're gonna read a verse that you needed for that week. You're gonna read a story that's gonna encourage you. You're gonna read something that challenges you. You're gonna read something that's gonna debunk a lie you've been believing your entire life. So if we can, if you, it's just if you're willing and able, if we can just put up both our hands, it's a posture to receive. And I'm just gonna pray for the Holy Spirit to fall into you, just, just to speak to you, to talk to you. There's nothing to be scared about. There's nothing weird that's gonna happen. I just believe that my voice has no power to do anything, but the Holy Spirit can speak to you right now. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, have your way today. Holy Spirit, fall into this place. Speak to every single couple. Speak to every child. Speak to every single person. Holy Spirit, start to speak. That you would start giving dreams and visions, Holy Spirit. You would start to encourage some people today to have their head down. God, your word says that you lift up the, 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 the heads of those that are discouraged. If anybody's discouraged today, Holy Spirit, you would encourage them. Challenge those that have been idle in their worship, Lord Jesus. Challenge us if we put off the Bible reading plans for so long. Help us today, Holy Spirit. Prompt us, prompt us, prompt us today to get started with our Bible plan. To not wait another day to not start this habit, to not start this discipline. Holy Spirit, we need more of you. Guide us in truth. Help us so when we see a lie, we would know truth right away. Help us to raise our children in truth. Help us to raise our family in truth. Help us to live by truth even when it feels more comfortable to live in a lie. Help us, Holy Spirit. This country needs you. These families need you. We need you, Holy Spirit. Bless us this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to pray for one last group of people. And sorry if I went long. I, I just really felt like this message was important for all of us, myself included, but I want to pray for one last group of people. And this is for you if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you wouldn't consider yourself a Christian, you maybe have never made a decision to, to follow after him, you just, you, you're just not walking with God, and that's okay, you're welcome here, we love you, we're so glad that you came. But here's the thing, we would be doing the wrong thing if we didn't give you an opportunity to change your life for the better. And here's the thing, what we believe and why this knowledge of God is so important is that the main knowledge that you need to know is that God loves you and he loves you so much. He wants to remove the sin that's in all of us. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. We're all sinners before God. And here's the thing, guys. God, he can't hang out with us because we're sinners. But he gave us a plan and an out in order to be in his presence, to get that, to get the forgiveness of our sins, to have a fresh start, a brand new beginning. 
and he sent his son Jesus to be sacrificed on the cross for you and for me. That's what we believe. God's plan to save humanity was to surrender his son for our sake. So much he loves us. So the plan was Jesus was gonna go to heaven, come down to earth. He was born as a baby. You know, we all practice a little baby Jesus on December. Like he started out as a baby, but he grew up to be a man. And his mission was to go on that cross. While he was on earth, he healed people, he taught, he, he helped people, he had a mission, he, he had a plan. But ultimately that plan led to the cross. So the time came, Jesus at the age of 33, the time had come, he was arrested. And here's what you need to know about Jesus. Jesus was perfect. He was fully God and fully human. He did no wrong. So he gave his life to the authorities. No one took his life. Jesus gave up his life to authorities. He was illegally tried. He was illegally beaten and humiliated. He was abandoned by his friends, abandoned by his family. And on that cross, Jesus died. Hands nailed, feet nailed, crown of thorns on his head. He took his last breath. They took the body of Jesus, they buried him in a tomb. And for three days, it looked like there was no hope that Jesus was just a liar. That what he was saying was all fake news. But on that third day, the Bible tells us that when they went to search the tomb, he wasn't there. It's because the truth is, the knowledge of God that you need to know is that Jesus defeated death and he defeated sin. He defeated those things. Those things no longer have power over your life if you allow them to. So how do we no longer become sin sinners? How do we change our life? How do we change our ways? How do we become people that follow God and experience the best life that he has for us? We have to surrender. That's all we have to do. Jesus did all the work. We didn't have to go on that cross. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't have to die for my sins. Jesus did that for me. So all I have to do is give the life, the keys of my life, and put it in the hands of Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm done driving. Jesus, I've been crashing all over the place. You take the wheels and you take me wherever you wanna go and your life will change. And so if we could bow our heads and close our eyes one more time for a moment of privacy, a holy moment we're about to walk into. I wanna give somebody an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus, you've never, you've never made a relationship. You've never made that decision to surrender, to love Jesus, to put your life in his hands. Today is your day. I wanna give you an opportunity an opportunity that's gonna change your life. And here's the thing, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you in the count of three to lift up your hands if you wanna give your life to Jesus. I'm not gonna put a mic in your face. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you out. But I wanna encourage you, don't wait for next week. Don't wait for next month. Make the decision today. Don't feel like you have to get your life in order, then come to Jesus. No, you cannot get your life in order without Jesus. Today is a day where your life changes, where you surrender your life to Him. Don't wait for tomorrow. Life is but a mist and a vapor. So if that's you, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. My heart is beating. I'm ready to go. This is what I need. On the count of three, you lift up your hand. One, two, three. You lift up your hand. You want to give your life to Jesus. God bless you. I see. Awesome. Awesome. You lift up your hands. Amazing. God bless you. Awesome. Thank you, Jesus. Here's what we're going to do. If you lifted up your hand, if you raised your hand, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And church, we do this prayer every single Sunday to repeat after me prayer. And it goes like this. They say it loud, they say it strong. It says this, Lord Jesus, I open my heart. I invite you inside to be my friend, to be my savior, to be my God. Lord, forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. From this day forward, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Jesus, I love you and I thank you. And everybody said, come on, let's celebrate. Let's put our hands together. Thank you, BJ. Put our hands together for everybody that raised their hand and uh, really believe you made the greatest decision of your entire life. And uh, your journey with Jesus starts today. And we know that you're gonna maybe have a bunch of questions like what, what the heck did I just do raising my hand? What's gonna happen? That's okay. I remember when I gave my life to Jesus, I was thinking the same thing. And as a church, we wanna help you on this journey. So one of the things we wanna do is give you a free gift, free 99, no extra charge in the mail, not like we owe, you owe us, nothing like that. It's a free Bible, it's a gift from us to you and it's right outside those doors. Our amazing Dream Team members wanna get one of these Bibles in your hand. And what I love about this Bible, is that it's super easy to read. It has resources for you on what, how to pray, what is faith, 
Do you get baptized? What is baptism even? This Bible can help you start your relationship with Jesus on the right foot. So get one of these. We got amazing Dream Team members. They're incredible. They want to get one in your hands and believe that they can help you on your way out. But church, let's be a church that reads our word, that really is passionate about reading our word. Not just on a Sunday, not just when it's convenient, but making sure that it's a priority in our everyday life. That it's not something that someone has to force us to do, but because we know who God is and what He's done for us, how can I not get closer to Him? How can I not want to know Him more? So I'm going to pray for your week, and then we're going to leave here singing with one more song. But I love you, church, and let's get better together every single day. I want to lift up our hands. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your word that teaches us. Thank you for your word that challenges us. Thank you for your word that gives us life, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that on our Monday and our Tuesday, we wouldn't forget in the craziness of life to make sure we spend time with you. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. Amen, amen. Love you, church. Let's sing one more time. God bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.